In the name of Jesus, amen. The Lord spoke 10 words, 10 commandments to Moses saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And even though he connects his identity to what we ought to do and not do, we still immediately make it all about us. We start recognizing very quickly that that was a bad idea because the law is hard. So we start preparing our excuses, our loopholes, because every last one of us has that one single itch that we just have to scratch. When we hear, thou shalt not, we are right away ready with, yeah, but what if, or even just a flat, no, because. See, God's law cuts everyone, and it cuts deep. You shall have no other gods before me. And the world says, what is truth? Follow your heart, just be happy, which are really clever ways of saying, we're gods now. But God starts with his identity before he would ever connect it to us. What if God actually wanted to be God to you? What if he wanted to provide for all of your needs of body and soul, take care of you as a father and save you from sin and death, devil and hell? What if he didn't want you to have to go and look elsewhere for the things to help you because he knew that that stuff wouldn't work? And so he insists on being your God. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God and just go ahead and ignore the word damn for half a second because it sounds so naughty that we are willing to wrap the whole entire commandment up in what you do or say when you stub your toe with no care at all about what a church would teach about God without bothering to learn ourselves what his word says. And in that, no matter what you say when you stub your toe, what kind of lies do we make him a god of? How corrosive can it get? God hates, and then you just insert the thing that you hate, the slurs, the political party, the people by name. And it's not just the negative either, but all the cute little bumper stickers that are just frankly a whole lot quicker to read than an actual chapter of scripture, even if you know that they don't come from there, like God only helps those who help themselves, or God needs you to say yes, invite him, accept him, give to him, so that he can help you. And if we cared about what God's word actually said, we would know. If we started with his identity instead of ourselves, we would see. What if God actually wanted you to know who he is, so that you would see mercy and love and compassion and peace instead of just death? What if he wanted you to know the answers to all of those tough questions that you are asking yourselves so that you wouldn't just be left alone trying to make up something and then wondering why it isn't working? Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy and before you get real upset like about track meets on Sunday and whether or not society still cares about the Lord's day, rejoice that God actually wants to be here so badly that he would carve out a whole day just to spend time with you. Do you really think that he was the tired one on the Sabbath day? So badly does he want to be with you to help you that he insists on spending time with you, that you would have rest in his house. Honor your father and your mother. And before God even finishes speaking this one, we reply, yeah, but like, you know, abusive parents and deadbeats. And sometimes mom and dad are just plain wrong. And it turns out that the parents that God gives you as a gift, they're sinners too. Not the generic poor, miserable sinners like we all wish we could be, but real specific ones. And you see how. But what if God could even work through sinners? What if he wanted to give you somebody to care for you? And would work through them to get you where you are today, even in the face of all of the sin and everything else that has gone wrong along the way? What if God was so powerful and so good that he would even get his will done through sinful people? Like when he used Caiaphas and Judas and Peter and Pilate, each of whom sinned along the way to bring about your salvation as Jesus bore the cross to forgive sinners like you, like them, and even like your parents. You shall not murder. And we have minimized this to a political argument about abortion and gun rights. And then we decided we can solve the whole thing just by voting the right way no matter what, winning political arguments with one-liners online, and calling it a day. But what if it was more? What if God actually gave you a body, something so central to who you are that he wants to see it taken care of and make sure nobody's allowed to hurt you? 
shall not commit adultery. And when you throw in the lusts of Christians that have been so normalized that we can't even take ourselves seriously as we try and walk a tightrope between what God's word says and what we know full well we are doing, watching online, or fantasizing about, what if God just wanted family to be a good gift to you? What if he wanted you to have one that was healthy and happy and he would build walls around your family so that all of those things wouldn't destroy it because sin breaks stuff even if it feels real good at the time. You shall not steal. And we think ourselves great, even though they're our neighbors, we would rather watch starve than help them. But what if God wanted you to have the stuff that you have because he loved you and other people too? You shall not bear false testimony against your neighbor. Don't gossip. And the church doesn't even try anymore. In no small part, because we are all too busy complaining about how awful society is. But what if God loved you so much that he would insist that your reputation be treated every bit the same way his is? What if your name was precious to God and he insisted that you be spoken well of? We could throw in the ones about coveting, but it's a little bit awkward to talk to you about while I preach from an iPad that I wanted because a friend of mine told me how much easier it would be. But still, what if God actually recognized that materialism isn't actually as healthy as all of the advertisements would lead me to believe? What if he wanted to re-emphasize that keeping all of these sinful things bottled up in my heart won't actually hide them, but just lets them fester like rot from the inside out that will escape? And in all of it, we get so used to keeping these commandments at arm's length because when you talk about the law, not just in abstract, not just in the sins of somebody else, but the real law, it unveils the one thing that we have tried so hard to hide, that we are hypocrites. Not just you. Me. I preach what I cannot do. God's law is perfect. I am not. The wages of sin is death, and that is my fault. That is your fault. The law shows us what's wrong. And the thing that we can't receive but by the working of the Holy Spirit is that that is a gift. It's a gift from the Lord who brought his children out of slavery, out of death, because he did not just give the law to enslave them to more death. It is a revelation of his character. See, love actually looks like something, and God loves you so much that he insists that you be well taken care of. He gives you the law to build walls around you to keep you safe, and that is the very same God who loved his people so much that he would rescue them from slavery. The law cannot stand on its own. It has to be tied to who God is. That's why he introduces it the way that he does. Yours is the God who not only rescues his people from slavery and not only gives the law, but also fulfills it for you too. Because love looks like something. When Jesus loves you, it looks like a cross. Jesus fulfills the law for you. He bleeds and he dies for you. And your sins are forgiven. All of them. The public ones, the secret ones. All of the burdens that we carry, he bore upon the tree for you, and your sins are forgiven. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is life everlasting in Christ Jesus our Lord. And if the law is already fulfilled, that means you don't have to hide from it anymore. That means you don't need to sling blame or block it with excuses. You can actually hope to love one another now. You can actually see how this might look, because when you love God and you love your neighbor, it looks like the law. And in it, we can hope to care for each other. We can even know that we will probably fail when we try. But God has already done what needs doing. He has fulfilled the law, and he will continue to work. God even works through sinners, through me, through you. And he gets done the things that could never be done by us alone, the things we could never even conceive as possible. It dares us to be optimists, even in the face of a world that is falling apart, even in the face of ourselves, because your sins are forgiven you, and that holiness is so potent, so active, so powerful, that God would work good through you, even as much as he works it for you. Because Christianity is not just hiding your hypocrisy by pretending you are better than you are. It is not excuses or throwing blame at the world. It is simply knowing who your God is. It is hope. Because the Christ was crucified and raised for you. Nothing can change that. Not even your failure to uphold the law. So we don't need to be afraid to be called sinners anymore. But even more, we are not afraid to get a little bit dirty along the way because the law has already been perfected in Christ. And so yes, love your neighbor and you will probably fail. But your identity is not owned by this. Your sin, your loss, your failure. 
Your identity is rooted in Christ, your Lord. We don't need to pretend to have a clean identity by our works. We have a real cleansing in the waters of our baptism. We do not have to worry about getting stained by a world. We are washed every day in these waters and named holy and worthy of love anew. Each day you start new. Each day you start holy. Each day you start pure. And so we make the sign of the cross. We remember our baptism. We remember who our God is. He is the Lord our God who has brought us up out of the land of death. In the name of Jesus. Amen.